play our character with Captain Mike, which is me, I am Captain Mike. Uh, this is about uh, non-player characters, all of those side characters, even the villains or the goons, all of these characters that are not played by players, but are rather played by the uh, often overworked and underappreciated game master. Uh, and just ways to make them pop a little bit more, make them a little bit more interesting, or even just make them feel more like characters and not necessarily sprites that just move across the screen and go boom. So, let's talk about my favorite subject, me. Uh, I am Captain Mike, uh, Michael Clegg is my traditional uh, name. Uh, I started gaming with Dungeons and Dragons, so I give myself the six cardinal characteristics of strength through charisma. Uh, I'm a presenter, I am also a teacher. In case, as uh, many of you have sussed out, that's pretty obvious in my opinion. Uh, I have a master's degree in writing, I have a bachelor's degree in English, I have 30 something years of role playing uh, under my belt. I recently had to increase the digit on that 30-something from a 20-something, I'm not real thrilled. Um, but I have been role-playing for a very long time. I've been role-playing, uh, I've role-played with a variety of people um, and in a variety of different situations, including um, like after-school programs and of course gaming with my friends, gaming with complete strangers, uh, all of which are very interesting and have their own kind of bits, but it kind of give me some different things to think about and I just kind of want to share those thoughts that I have with you. Enough to make a PowerPoint slide, apparently. All right, but if you've been to any of my other panels, you've seen this slide before, and certainly if you come to another one, you'll see it again. Um, all, uh, all players are people and all people are different. It's always important to know your audience. Uh, this is the best advice I can give to any game master, to any player, to any communicator in any fashion. Uh, the more you know about your players and what they are looking for in terms of the game itself, in terms of story, in terms of combat, in terms of what they're what kind of a world they're going to be playing in for a while, the better you can make that world match what they want. Uh, and if not what they want, maybe what they need. Uh, so know your audience and also be aware that you are in, in many very significant ways part of that audience. So if you as a game master want a particular style or story, uh, make sure that you make that, uh, make that a part of it as well. Every game master should be comfortable telling the story Otherwise, why are you doing it? Pressure? Peer pressure? Television shows told me that was bad. And they're pretty cool. All right, so non-player characters. What is a non-player character? NPCs, non-player characters. Um, it's anyone that is controlled by the GM as opposed to a player specifically. So this could be uh, you know, Johnny the blacksmith or you know, the, the group of orcs that came over the hill to attack the party or the supervillain at, um, at the end of the adventure. Uh, whoever it is is controlled by the game master. And ultimately, these characters are still characters, which means that they're people. And people are really complicated. Even people who seem very simple and straightforward, um, there are usually complicated reasons why they're so simple and straightforward. Why are they so stoic? Why, how have their lives been so, so simple that they were able to just be simple people? And even if they are just simple people, which some people are, uh, how does that how does that bounce off of someone who is complicated? How does, how does someone who has a very simple and straightforward view of life deal with the truly bizarre? Um, you know, when a farmer, you know, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons and you have a, a small village in the middle of nowhere, which has pretty much been the same for hundreds of years, every generation just does what the generation did before them, and then you have a group of adventurers come in with the armor of the gods and swords that glow and, you know, magic spells just kind of crackling off of them, how do they react? Well, sometimes they're just like, oh, look, a group of adventurers just came in. Uh, get, better get back to uh, plowing these fields. But maybe they're afraid. Maybe they're mystified. Maybe they just want them gone because oftentimes people who have routine lives, they like the routine and anything that disrupts the routine, they, they want to get rid of it. Uh, but people are complicated. They have wants, they have needs. Uh, they often want to do things like survive and live, which... I think it's pretty accessible. Uh, but this kind of comes up when you have like, uh, you know, when, when the adventuring party is like, okay, we've got to go into the tomb of certain death. Um, 
we're all high-level adventurers, and you know we've got magic items, and we should be pretty good, but we need both of our hands free for using our plus 50 swords and our zap ray, uh, death ray, zap rays. Um, so we're going to hire a torch bearer who is level zero and has four hit points. And he's going to come with us to hold the torch. What could go wrong, right? And you know, a torchbearer might be like, well, I need the money. I'm sure they'll keep me safe. But then when the minotaur, you know, with another minotaur on his shoulders shows up, <laughs> listen, the tomb of certain death is called that for a reason. <laughs> when, the, you know, when a minotaur shows up, that torchbearer, you know, okay, fine. You know, you could give him a morale check or whatever. But is that torchbearer the kind of person to just cut and run? Like, pff, five gold ain't worth this here, and then take off, or are they going to be like, you know, I, got, I have a sense of duty, I, you know, I'm committed to this, I gotta just do the best that I can. Um, what happens to that torchbearer when the adventuring party forgets, uh, forgets that he's there? And just kind of goes into the next room, or falls down a pit, and the torchbearer doesn't fall with them? Does the torchbearer help them out? Or does the torchbearer say, well, I'm not getting paid, and take off? Or does the torchbearer take all of the treasure that the party didn't fall down that hole with and decide that he's going to start his own company, Torchbearers Incorporated. <laughs> all right. Um, so all of this is really getting into the character of the non-player characters, remembering that they have these driving goals and these functional elements in terms of story. Uh, so let's talk about the types of NPCs. Uh, I see NPCs as being roughly in four different groups. You've got your background NPCs, which fill out the, you guessed it, background. Uh, you've got your supporting cast, which are going to be the more interactive sort of NPCs. The goons, which are the bad guys that you chop up on the way to the, to the real deals, uh, to the really important parts, uh, i.e. the villains, which I already did two presentations on, but I will still talk about them. Uh, because in terms of just non-player characters, they are kind of interesting themselves. Um, oh, by the way, uh, I specified that I was a teacher earlier, which means that I'm used to people uh, asking questions just kind of whenever, so feel free to raise your hands if you have a question or shout them out or what have you along the way. Um, I will try to have enough time at the end to address questions, but certainly even after the, uh, uh, after the presentation, you can come up and chat with me. Uh, happy to answer any questions at that point, but if you have any questions along the way, feel free to kind of just go ahead and, and let me know. Uh, doop -a -doop -a -doop. So let's talk about background characters first. Background characters typically are not speaking parts. If this was a movie production, they would get paid the absolute least the company, could, the film company could get away with. Uh, they have no lines or just a handful of like, oh, this way, uh, adventuring party, or this, this way to wherever, uh, I'll let the king know, that sort of thing. Uh, they typically don't even have a name. Like, they're just the courier, or the bartender, or the blacksmith, or the police chief. Uh, in fact, uh, one story that I do love to tell for this, uh, years and years and years ago, I was running a game of Dungeons and & Dragons, and a couple of players, you know, came up to the castle, and so they came in, and the place was in a tizzy because there was some sort of, uh, you know, murder-suicide plot. It was basically the end of Hamlet. Um, and so, <laughs> oh, some... See, some literary folks are in the audience. Uh, and so basically, nobody had any time for these adventurers. So just, uh, uh, um, I just totally forgot the, the cast. Um, a handmaiden or whatever, wash, you know, washing lady was just like, uh, we're kind of busy. So I guess, you know, etiquette calls for us to let you come in and stay in this room while we kind of get this sorted out. Um, and what I forgot to do, or what I forgot was, uh, not to give her her name, because one of the characters said, oh, what is your name? And so I just came up with a name off the top of my head, and I was like, oh, my name is Melina, uh, right this way. And the players spent about the next 30 minutes to an hour trying to figure out why she was so important. <laughs> like, seriously, they were like, is she the assassin? Is, is this a plot? Is she being, like, mind-controlled by someone who's planning something? I'm like, no. No, finally, I had to just be like, she is literally not important. I had to just flat out say, I just came up with a name off the top of my head. I was playing Mortal Kombat the other day. <laughs> like, that's all it is. She's not a, she's not a part of the rest of this story. <laughs> like, it was getting kind of creepy. Like, like the one, one character was basically stalking her, trying to figure out, like, okay, well, she went, she went, into, the, uh, you know, she went into the tower, um, 
but maybe that's where her secret lair is, or maybe that's where the escape tunnel is. I'm like, no, that's where they do the washing. <laughs> yeah, but are the washing tubs full of like poison? I'm like, no, soap. <laughs> Which I guess is technically poisonous. <laughs> It's full of lie. Ah, a tower of lies. No, geez, L-Y-E, geez. Oh, man. Um, oh, geez, I, I forgot to set my timer. Mm. This will be interesting if I manage to end on time. <laughs> um, okay, so typically they don't have any lines, or if they do, they're just, or I mean, any names, uh, or if they do, they tend to be pretty straightforward, and it's generally accepted that these are not going to be characters who individually steer the course of the adventure. They might kind of bump characters into the right direction by saying things like, you know, oh, I wouldn't go into the graveyard, uh, although I suppose that's good advice just, to, you know, all the time, unless you're having a funeral. Um, Background characters are not really planned. They're just kind of like, and then there will be people who are doing this kind of general thing. And then there are people who are sell setting up for the, the Thanksgiving Day Parade. There will be people who are setting up for the, I don't know, King's Feast or you know whatever. Or they're just townspeople, going, going about townspeople lives. Uh, so they're not specifically planned individually, uh, but they're very good for providing sort of generalized hurdles, these kinds of uh, blockades that aren't really intended to stump the players, but maybe show the players that there are hoops that they have to go through to get certain things. So for example, if you wanted to make it difficult for an adventuring party to resupply their weapons, maybe the blacksmith uh, is just very garrulous, or uh, not garrulous, um, very uh, um, hard to get along with, or just takes a disliking to the adventurers or something like that. Um, or maybe it's just that the background characters, uh, they form the crowds that people have to get through uh, in, in order to pursue, I don't know, Melina the washing lady. Uh, and so they can provide sort of generalized hurdles. They're usually not even things that need to be role played out specifically. Uh, and these include, you know, shopkeepers, bartenders, people on the street, anyone with minimal personal impact on the story. But they can, as a group, have a very powerful influence on the tone of the story as well as the setting of the story. For example, if you have a small uh, medieval village, well, if that's going to be a small medieval village in like the Castlevania world where the undead wander around, they're going to be very afraid of outsiders and they're going to be very much the kind of people who are inside when it's nighttime and perhaps even the people who might be armed. Um, on the other hand, if you have a village where everyone's very friendly and people are curious about outsiders, that gives a much more positive, much less gloomy sort of a tone. It shows that the world itself is not one that they're afraid of, uh, but rather one that they can be very interested in and not necessarily be killed by zombies. Although, you know, who knows, right? Um, and so when you're, when you're uh, playing these kinds of non-player characters, they tend to be very generalized, like I said. Uh, they tend not to have any particular specifics individually, um, but they can be useful, and they can also uh, be very useful showing the kind of overall plot that may be forming up. Like I said, if, all, if you walk into town and everyone just kind of naturally is like, oh, well, it's almost sundown, so I guess you know, I'll see you tomorrow, and everybody just is heading towards the indoors and not just you know, not just like into bars, but specifically going home and everything, and then you, like locking their doors or like barring their doors and so forth. Uh, that sends a pretty hefty signal to the adventurers. And that's not something that people might necessarily think to say to someone who comes into their town, because if, if it's normal at night for giant bats to come down and, and pick up anybody who's outside, which is a lousy place to have a village, but hey, whatever. Um, you know, they're not gonna think that any newcomer is not necessarily gonna know that. Maybe it's the same everywhere, right? But that says a lot about the world that you have. All right, uh, moving from there, we have supporting cast. Supporting cast are named characters, and these are characters that have more interaction with the player characters. They have a little more personality, there might be something that sets them out from the rest of the crowd. They may even be background characters that just kind of keep showing up often enough that they end up with more lines. Um, and they can provide very useful details about the setting. These are going to be more specific details, and they are probably going to be pushing the uh, player characters towards whatever quest idea you have in mind or whatever kind of plot hooks you have lying around. Um, 
it is very uncharacteristic, I think, of people to just straight up give quests to people who wander into their town. Like if I'm sitting at, at Wawa or whatever convenience store getting, getting some coffee and I see someone I don't know, I don't normally say things like, I could really use 10 cabbages. Because one, what do I need 10 cabbages for? But two, why would I think that person would get me 10 cabbages? Uh, you know, or, if I'm, if, or, or to give it a more realistic version, like if I'm at a convenience store and I'm like, man, uh, the crime rate is really high, and I see someone who seems like you know, I haven't seen that person before, I'm not going to be like, hey, the crime rate's really high. If only someone would do something about all these criminals. <laughs> yeah, do you know anyone? You look like a strapping young adventurer. At that point, I'm the villain. Um, but at the same time, you can make it part of just the casual conversation. I mean, oftentimes people will say things like, hey, did you read on Reddit? Or hey, did you, if they're old, um, they might say, hey, did you read in the paper? Uh, you know, I can't believe, you know, that sort of stuff. Oh, can you believe crime is on the rise? Yeah. No one could possibly fix that. All right, maybe without the stare. But people do have these kinds of general conversations. Or if, uh, if you do have a town that's full of townsfolk and they're not used to outside visitors, they, there might be a number of people who are unhappy about that, and there might be a number of people who are just curious. They just want to know what's going on, and they might let plot hooks slip along the way. Like, wow, you, you've got a sword. Are you a knight? Are you a, a warrior? Uh, Mom, I want to be a warrior. Um, and... and go, uh, you know, and go visit the shrine in the forest, but my mom says that there's monsters there. You know, these sorts of more incidental plot hooks can fit in a little bit more naturally. Uh, was there a question? I thought I saw a hand go up, but I'm very easily distracted, so no? No? Good? Okay. Um, so, supporting cast, they're typically planned in at least some detail ahead of time. Uh, some idea. It could be something as simple as, okay, when the, when the, uh, superheroes, uh, when we start off the session, the police chief is going to contact them. And the police chief is this kind of basic sort of a person. Basically, uh, I don't know, tough, grizzled, um, dislike superheroes. Quick, simple, easy. Uh, they have a more active role with the party. They have maybe not necessarily a relationship specifically with them. You know, we're not, not, you know, not every police commissioner is Jim Gordon who has nothing better to do than hang out with Batman. Uh, most of them are actually quite busy. Um, that's right, a dig on DC. Sorry, Harley. Um, but, uh, but there's some sort of element there where they just get involved a little bit more or they're just willing to spend more time with the party. It might be a torchbearer. It might be any of the other henchmen that go along with the adventuring party. It might be the boy wonder that is, uh, you know, kind of going along with the superheroes. Um, it could, even, uh, it could even be an animal. Um, the story that I typically tell for this is about Harvard the donkey, which is, yeah, that's his name, Harvard. I was running this game in Connecticut, by the way. Um, so yeah, Harvard the donkey was just re your regular 20 gold piece donkey. Needed him to carry some stuff. The, the adventuring party, Dungeons and Dragons, where they were going to head out and uh, they didn't know how long they would be. So they were like, we should take a bunch of stuff, but none of us wants to deal with encumbrance rules. So we'll just get a donkey and put everything on the donkey. And that was fine. And all I did was say, okay, the donkey's name is Harvard. And they were like, okay. I was like, you can rename him if you want. They were like, why would we, rena we rename a donkey? And why would we change his name from Harvard? Uh, and so we went along. And that could have still just been the, the end of it. It's still just a 20 gold piece donkey, carries 100 gold pieces worth of weight, whatever. Uh, but I, as a GM, kept in mind that the donkey was there, which meant that that provided its own set of challenges. Because Dungeons and Dragons is full of graveyards and undead. And in fact, most animals kind of get like iffy around, you know, haunted, you know, quote unquote, haunted areas in, in our world. Imagine how much they're going to dislike haunted areas in a world with literal ghosts actual ghosts that rise from the ground and from the negative material plane. Uh, so Harvard just wouldn't go in places. And they were like, why are you not? Come on, you stupid donkey. And then they had to go with that. And then they started figuring out why Harvard wouldn't go into these places. And they were like, oh, Harvard's afraid of the undead. And I was like, wow, you just called him Harvard, not the donkey. And so they were like, Harvard's afraid of the undead. And they were like, OK, here's what we're going to do. 
anytime Harvard doesn't want to go someplace, we're going to investigate it because that's where the undead are, and then we can like use them as like an undead detector. <laughs> and it was just like, will you go over here? Yes, okay. Go over here. No. Ooh. Nope. Ooh, we got like a 10 on the undead meter. Come on, okay. Swords out, spells ready. Um, and then uh, they kind of got. Uh, one of the undead kind of attacked unexpectedly, and it became apparent that this might cause damage to Harvard. Like they had put this this donkey in in harm's way, and then they didn't do that anymore. They w went out of their way to make sure that Harvard was safe. They would, uh, you know, they were like, okay, we're going to go into this crypt. Um, we got to make sure that Harvard has enough water, has enough food. Are they okay? Brush the coat. You know, make sure he's okay. Do we need to? Do we need to like leave someone behind to stay with Harvard? And I was like, he's still a competent donkey. Like he can figure out food on the ground, water in the water. You know, when the rain, rain ditch. Um, you know, I didn't want to make the game basically like the Barbie horse adventures of Harvard the donkey. Um, I mean, maybe that's the kind of game you're running, and that's cool, man. I, I'm just saying that wasn't the game I had planned at the time. Uh, so it's amazing how something as simple as like a name and just a little bit of personality can really draw that that sense of personness even to things that aren't technically people. Um, actually, <laughs> in one of my other panels, I had someone ask me, "So how's Harvard doing?" Uh, and I was like, "Oh, that's so sweet. Uh, he's doing fine." Um, supporting cast members. Uh, they have personalities, like Harvard had a personality, and, or develop a personality. Harvard developed a personality. Uh, oh, question in the back? How do you prevent NPC, or how do you prevent PCs from killing what? The supporting, the supporting cast. That's a good question. Um, how do you stop players from, how do you stop players from killing anything is actually a pretty good question. Um, there are a couple of ways around that. Um, the, Ideally, they shouldn't kill the supporting cast because the supporting cast are people and normally killing people is bad. Now, if you are running a, a game where you have evil characters, then that might not be the impediment that it should otherwise be. Um, part of the, the way to keep NPCs from just becoming like wandering chunks of, of experience points and information is by giving them these kinds of personalities because then it seems they seem more human. Uh, and so there's that kind of like, you know, in a video game, it's very easy to kill a, a non-player character that's just going to, you knew that that character was going to disappear the moment you turned around anyway. Uh, so there's less reason to keep them alive. Um, but the more character and the more personality that they have, and the more consequences that have, that, that surround that, the, real, the realistic consequences that uh, surround, you know, killing a person, even in a setting where, you know, death is an everyday sort of a thing, um, that can really put, uh, put more thought into whether or not they should be killing any character, let alone a, a supporting cast member. Um, supporting cast members, if you're running like an evil, a group of evil characters, um, then either those supporting cast members may just have very dangerous lives, uh, or if the supporting cast know that the players are, not, not the players hopefully, uh, but the player characters are evil, then there's a good chance the supporting cast, they're pretty used to being cutthroat too. So they should be, you know, clever enough to be like, you know, to play the whole I'm more valuable alive game uh, or the uh, it's more dangerous to kill me than let me live game or both, ideally. Um, but it's possible. Supporting cast members do occasionally get it in the neck or the back or the heart or, you know. Um, but the good question. Thank you. Um, supporting cast members should have personalities, and even if you just kind of, you're, you're totally blindsided by uh, the encounter and you just kind of have to come up with a couple of basic personality traits or even just let some develop, let those develop. Let them become the personality of the character uh, and that will carry them through. Uh, and as a result of that, they should have alternate viewpoints. They should have occasions where they are right and they should have occasions where they are wrong. Because if you have an NPC who is just always right, basically become, they become a mouthpiece for the GM. And so you don't want people, uh, you don't want a situation where the adventuring party is like, okay, we're here in the, the cave of certain death. Should we go left or should we go right? Let's ask the torchbearer. <laughs> what do you think? I think I'm not paid enough for this. Um, because if the torchbearer always says what the GM is thinking, which is you should go left because that's the safe way, or what the GM is thinking, which is that you should go right because that is more certain death, 
um, that becomes basically less of a character and more just like carrying around a map uh, that you just have to ask questions to. Um, so they should have occasions where they're wrong, or they should have occasions where they just have a very different perspective. Um, an adventuring party in the middle of a crypt might ask a torchbearer, you know, two of us think we should go left, two of us think we should go right. Torchbearer, which way do you think you should go? You can cast the deciding vote. The torchbearer might say, um, well, uh, the, the left side looks dimly lit, and the right side looks like it is like full of creepy plants, so we should avoid the plants and just give a shot. Uh, or just not have an opinion. Like, I don't know, you're the professionals. I'm still thinking of leaving. Um, and if you're not sure as a GM, just roll for it. Roll which way does the, you know, which way does the NPC choose? No, oh, it chooses this way. Um, but consider their viewpoint. Consider which thing they do. Uh, every time we went left so far, uh, I nearly got killed, so I think we should go right. Something like that. Uh, and so as a result, they can be sometimes wrong which I'm sure is not going to ingratiate them to any of the players, but that's kind of how, that's how people are, right? Sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they even make the right decision for the wrong reasons and they make the wrong decision for the right reasons. Your NPCs are allowed to be wrong. It's okay to have the poli police commissioner say, all right, uh, Dr. Destroyo is hiding out in the old factory and then the heroes get to the old factory and it's a trap. Well, yeah, of course it's a trap and if I have five minutes left. Okay, <sighs> my heart stopped. <laughs> I'm like I'm only halfway through my thing. <laughs> I have a notoriously bad sense of time, and this. Yes. Okay. Good. <sighs> wow. Like, the, of course, the one time that I don't remember to set my timer at the beginning, that's when I get like the five minutes left halfway through. It's like I'm being punked. <laughs> See, sometimes non-player characters are wrong. I got boos for that. Oh. Why are you booing? I'm right. <laughs> this was <laughs> all planned. That is the, the credo of the game master, right? All of this was intentional. <laughs> I spent six months and $43,000 worth of planning. Um, so yeah, sometimes NPCs are wrong. Uh, and this can include this can include your quest givers. Quest givers, like I said, the police commissioner might send you send the players to uh, the player characters to the factory because he's working on wrong information because it's a trap, and so he was fed wrong information. He's allowed to be wrong, or he might just make a judgment call and say like, okay, you know, it, the Doctor Destroyer could be here, here, or here, but my gut tells me it's this one. Sometimes the gut's wrong. Uh, and, so the sporting cast, I mean, this could be quest givers, followers, contacts, any kind of recurring characters that have some sort of major influence on how the party acts or reacts or how the storyline moves along. Um, yeah. Cool? Cool. Okay. So enough about these good guys, Mike. You mentioned non-player characters are also the bad guys? Well, yeah, the bad guys are also... Uh, people who are controlled by the GM, or if, even if they're monsters. Monsters could have personality too. I mean, Harvard the donkey may not be typically thought of as being a monster, but hey, he's technically uh, worth, what, 12 experience? That's terrible, Mike. No one would kill Harvard for 12 experience. So this group I just playfully call goons. This is any group of enemies that are just going to be thrown at the heroes and their purpose is not necessarily to kill the heroes, like that might happen, sure. Um, but the expectation is that the heroes are gonna kind of grind their way through them or it's going to provide an interesting challenge. Uh, but nobody in the group is really like specifically named. They're just kind of, you know, stormtroopers or orcs or uh, whatever else you wanna throw at them. Uh, and so goons typically have no name. They often have very few lines aside from like, get him, shouldn't have come here. You picked a bad time to get lost, friend. Can't wait to get back to playing Skyrim. Uh, these are usually planned as encounters as opposed to having like specific personalities or, or particular intentions. Uh, aspects of, your, of these non-player characters may prove to be very important and they might show something about the force with whom they work uh, or for whom they work. Uh, my favorite kinds of goons are um, Cobra troops. Cobra troops are kind of interesting to me because why would you work for someone who always loses? Like it just seems weird. Um, 
And so I feel that it's important that there should be like a brochure version that goons get that make them work for whoever they work for. Because it seems kind of weird, right? Uh, who would work for Cobra Commander? His, and he, he obviously just opposes every country in the world, which seems like a tall order. And his number of victories is zero, and his number of losses is the number of episodes in the series. <laughs> that is not a good track record. Um, but there should be like a brochure version. So why would, they, why would people even get into a situation, especially a life-threatening situation where they have to work for these people? And it could be, you know, of course, Cobra, Cobra Commander is an extreme example, but consider like Dr. No or like Bond villains in general. You know, who, who looks at the want ads and is like, hmm, construction, construction crew needed for remote volcanic island to build giant drill into Earth. Well, I did take auto shop in high school. Uh, you know, who's doing this? And so that kind of goes into it. Sometimes goons should just break and run because they didn't sign up for this. When the adventurers show up, and especially if the adventurers are kind of like a roving kill squad, many goons are not, that's not what they were hired to do and they are going to get out. Or they're going to just say, you know what, this isn't worth it, surrender, flee, etc. Um, but it can provide this sort of brochure version. Um, there was a group in the White Wolf universe, uh, the Nefandi, and they were originally introduced as sort of like an all-purpose bad guy squad because they were a group of demon worshippers who would just do terrible things. Like that was their entire MO, was like, join the Nefandi, we do terrible things. Um, which doesn't make for good cover copy. Um, but then a source book came out for the Nefendi, and I was talking to a friend of mine about it, and he was like, yeah, I felt like they were kind of being apologetic and took the fangs out of the Nefendi because it's like they, they kill people and they do all these terrible things, but it's to keep like demons from taking over the world. Like they do little evil to keep the big evil quiet. And I feel like that just kind of makes them less, e like, less evil because they have this good reason. And I was like, I don't know, that sounds like a pretty good brochure to me. Like if that was what in incoming people were told, then by the time they figured out that that's not true, they're too far in, right? So that can really show a lot about the organization that you're working for. If it's a truly evil organization, uh, the people who are the newest should have the least idea that it's evil. And the people who are not new should either be like, yeah, we're evil, what are you gonna do about it? Uh, sort of attitude, or like, we're evil, but like, I like I'm, I'm, I'm in it. Like, I can't get out of it. How do I get out of it? Which might give you some good opportunities for uh, character development among the player characters. You know, chances to, to be like, we can help you get out. You know, we can help you, uh, you know, get a, you know, get a, get a, get a regular job. Know, sounds a little high school guidance counselor to me. Um, but, you know, supervillains kind of fall into the same category. You know, how many people are supervillains just because, you know, no one's going to hire a 20 foot tall man of stone because, and especially after he's knocked over a few banks, like that's kind of a hard rap sheet to avoid. Um, and but when you are characterizing goons, you should not characterize your goons too much unless you specifically want to create that moral quandary, because there's a big difference between a group of orcs are attacking. Okay, orcs, they're evil. We're good. Swords, stab, stab, stab. Ah, oh, you've killed me, you darn humanoid races that are traditionally considered good in a Tolkien-esque world. This is quite a long line to say while you're dying. Um, but it's another thing when, when you know, it's like a group of orcs are attacking, stab, and it's like, oh, what will I tell my wife and children? <laughs> Whew. Uh, whoa, what's that sword doing there? I was just walking by. No, oh, officer, I uh, sword attacked him, magical sword. Terrible shame. Uh, so unless you specifically want to bring in that moral quandary, uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, and this includes, you know, orcs, stormtroopers, enemy cannon fodder, and so forth. Um, and coincidentally, these classes of NPCs, they're not discrete. You can definitely move from one to the other. You can definitely be like a background character that becomes, um, you know, sort of a named character and has more, uh, more effect. And you can also, you know, change sides. Consider your villains. Villains are typically named. Uh, in fact, they are almost always named, or even if the name that they get is something like the nameless one, or he who shall not be spoken of, or whatever Rowling put in. Uh, so villains are named, uh, they're definitive or derivative of the setting, which means that either they make the setting, 
or the setting has made them. They are a reflection of that setting. Sauron is definitely, uh, he makes that setting. He is what makes Mordor Mordor. Like, would Mordor even, I always kind of wonder, what is Mordor like after Sauron falls? I mean, he's the one that brought in the orcs. Does, do, can plants grow there later? Like, if you go later, are people like, wow, they really cleaned Mordor up. This place used to be a dump. This is nice. They've got, like, a community park. They've got live theater. Um, oh, and, or they could be derivative of the setting. If you have a setting that is going to create the villains, those villains should reflect that they are made because of the setting. I don't want to name any recent films involving DC characters that normally fight Batman. Um, but you could consider the J guy uh, to be derivative of the setting. He's a product of society, but it's just that he's gone evil. I'm talking about the Joker. Am I being too obtuse on that? So I'm talking about the Joker. Uh, he's derivative of the setting. Uh, indeed, Batman, not that Batman's a villain, depending on who you are. Um, you know, Batman's also pretty derivative of the setting, but in the same way Joker is too, especially classic Joker, who was just like a regular gangster sort of a figure, or person having a lousy day, or gang member, depending on which of the histories you read. Um, and then he just kind of gets involved in what? Uh, falls in acid is traditionally accepted as being involved. Uh, sometimes it involves being thrown in by Batman, or sometimes it involves falling accidentally, or you know, what have you. But like, that says a lot about Gotham, right? That they just have vats of acid that are uncovered and basically no OSHA presence. That's all part of Gotham, crumbling, untrustworthy, just generally not safe, not uh, federally compliant. Um, and so you can tell a lot about the setting based on the villains themselves. Villains are, uh, they're planned, they should be planned carefully. Even if there's someone who was originally a goon, who kind of became a villain, maybe it was the last man standing from a group of orcs, and he would vowed revenge or what have you. They need those extra time, or they need the extra time, the extra thought, like, why, you know, why is the villain doing this? What is it that their goal is? What are they trying to accomplish? And how can my players mess it up? Um, they have purpose. They have perspectives. Not all villains are just like, I'm here to kill the player characters, because that's a very specific sort of approach to things. Um, they want to, do, to accomplish a thing, and then maybe their goal is to defeat the player characters. Uh, maybe the player characters, like, they're the heroes of the land, and the villain's like, if I take out the, you know, the heroes of the land, then I'm the next, you know, then I'm the toughest person. I'm the big dog. Uh, you know, maybe that's their perspective. Maybe their perspective is just that the heroes are wrong. Like what they're doing is wrong. They're, you know, they're going about it all wrong. They're they're making society weaker, and so I need to destroy them, and then I can make society stronger. You know, whatever. Uh, they, villains should seem like they have a life. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of energy for villainy. Has anybody tried it? It's exhausting. Like you get up in the morning, you're just like, okay, first I stretch obviously, then mad cackling for one hour, uh, then yoga, uh, rob a bank, uh, drive a busload of nuns into an orphanage, lunch, light lunch, etc. you know, it, or even if it's just someone who's like, you know, gets up, okay, time for another 12 hours of working on my steampunk death ray shaped like a tulip. It takes a lot to kind of keep them going. And so villains, I mean, they have lives, even if they are maniacally focused, even if they are, uh, you know, so racked with revenge that they take on ridiculous names like Dr. Destroyo and put on crazy outfits to rob banks. They still do stuff in their spare time. Um, they still hang out with other people. They still have relationships that they have. Um, by a coincidence, I have a Harley Quinn reference, because if any of you read the, uh, when Harley Quinn first got her own set of comics, uh, there's a scene in it where she goes home to her family. And it's really kind of interesting. It was a really good character moment, because she had, was just kind of like, I'm finally done with the Joker, and I'm just kind of going to try to be on my own. And of course, that goes about as well as you might imagine. Uh, but then she just, she kind of like goes home to just check in with the family. And her family is like, you're still dressing like a clown and running around at night, aren't you? And she's like, yeah. Are you still, you know, did you get the money I sent? 
uh, I notice that you still keep accepting the the cash that I send back, and it's like, oh, that's why she's been that's what she's been doing with all that extra cash. That's interesting. And then she has like, you know, you know, friends, family, and so forth. And it's like, wow, why, what a way to characterize someone. Um, you know, having a life, uh, they should seem like they have hobbies, they have other things that they do. That also, by the way, allows them to do things like network with other villains and also displays certain hobbies that may allow them to be either more distinctive for the heroes to recognize or um, uh, may even lead to new sets of villainy. So villains also believe themselves to be the hero. It's an old expression. Everyone is the hero of their own story and everyone is the villain of someone else's story. So when you're constructing a villain, no villain is like, okay, I'm just going to be a complete jerk and then everyone's going to hate me and then eventually someone's going to throw me off of a tall tower. Yeah, no need to buy a calendar for next year. Uh, that's not what's going on. They're thinking, I'm going to do this and maybe they recognize that they're doing terrible things to people and they just have to be okay with that. It takes a special kind of person to do that, but it's possible. Villainy. Um, but they need to believe that they're the hero in some way, even if that hero is just to themselves. Like, I'm going to screw over all of these people, but it means that I get to have all of the money, or I get to have all of the power. And then when I have all of the power, I can do whatever it is I want to do. Whether it's uh, reshape society into a classless system like Dr. Horrible, or just sit around all day like Scar from The Lion King. You know, however it is. They don't have to be good at what they eventually try to get. They just have to try to get it. Uh, and this includes like the big bad and lieutenants and major antagonists and so forth. Um, and uh, like I said, these are not discrete categories. You can move from one to the other. You can go from being a friend or an ally of the party and then have them become villains because maybe there was a falling out or maybe there was just some sort of disagreement in the approaches. You know, what, you know it's like, you always say that we can't kill the bad guys, but the, you know, Dr. Destroyo just killed like 30 people if we just, you know, just two to the head. Like, that would solve all of our problems. We're heroes. We don't do that. We can't cross the line. I'm crossing the line. If you cross the line, I'm coming after you. This sounds like another Punisher and Spider-Man reference, Mike? Yeah, it does. Why'd you call me Mike? Whatever, Peter Parker. Um, so it could be something like that. It can even be, uh, you can of course have a switch from like just goons to villains, and you can even have switches from villains to heroes. Um, anybody here ever hear of, uh, I know it wasn't that popular, uh, Dragon Ball Z? Yep, wildly popular, by the way. Um, Piccolo is a great example, or in fact, any of the villains in Dragon Ball Z, uh, now that I think about it. But yeah, many of them were villains, and then for one reason or another, they were turned over to the good side, sometimes willingly, sometimes begrudgingly. Uh, my favorite was, was Piccolo's uh, transition, which was just that, you know, was way back when, Piccolo was like, I'm going to destroy the Earth because it, it sucks. And Goku's like, don't do that, and he's like, I'm going to do that. Uh, and then Vegeta and, and all the other Saiyans show up and Piccolo's like, no, 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 I said I was going to destroy the Earth. You don't get to destroy the Earth, I get to destroy the Earth, and I will destroy anyone who tries to destroy the Earth except for me, because I will destroy the Earth. And then later he was like, I guess Earth is okay. Uh, so you can definitely transition from one side to the other. Um, my favorite example of this comes from the same story as Harvard the Donkey, um, which is uh, there was the characters were going, they were supposed to do this. They were supposed to go to a dwarven town, find out that it was in the middle of a civil war, pick a side, fight in that, and then the background for this was that there was a group of hobgoblins moving in, and they were going to, uh, you know, provide complications. They were basically going to attack after the Civil War, and then it's like, you know, the heroes have to really shine during this big wartime fight. Um, I said supposed to because that's not what happened. Uh, instead, they went in, they didn't pick a side. In fact, half of them kind of like were working with one side and half of them kind of moved to the other side, but they were like, they really have good points on both sides. Uh, and I was like, that's not... That's not how civil wars are supposed to go. Um, you're supposed to pick one and then move to the other. Um, but then they found out about the hobgoblin invasion and they were like, we gotta stop this civil war because of the hobgoblin invasion. And they were like, why are there hobgoblins? And I was like, how are you gonna find out how there are hobgoblins? And he was like, we're gonna go talk to them. <laughs> hmm. Let me check my notes. Never planned for that. All right. 
Let's go. So they went out, they found some hobgoblins, did a little bit of fighting, did a little bit of talking, and basically managed to find out that the hobgoblins were only there because they were displaced. I had kind of done a little bit of my own homework uh, originally, and I was like, well, why are there hobgoblins? And so, like, you know, orcs took over their land. So these hobgoblins were just kind of like, they were moving out, and they were like, we need a new place, and we were going to take over this dwarven town because it looks like they're a bunch of losers, and we were just going to move in. And they were like, hey, funny story. Um, we were only coming to this dwarven town because we were sent by our queen to hire troops for her own war. What if you came and fought for her? We can promise you land. And they were like, yeah, all right. That sounds, that sounds way easier than taking over this dwarven village. The more we got here, this was looking like a pain in the butt. Uh, and so these goons had to suddenly become a supporting cast, and then they had to go adventuring, and I, I had to put together like a rat pack of like hobgoblin warriors. Um, and what I did uh, is I used some random rolling, actually. Um, I think the site that I used is called Donjon, D-O-N-J-O-N. Ah, I see some people nodding, it's gotta be that one. Donjon, um, I forget the extension, but if you just Google Donjon random generator, should be one of the top five hits. Um, they have uh, just a huge number of random, um, uh, random generators for treasure types and even adventures and uh, monster, um, monster stuff. And one of them is a list of NPCs, and it just gives like a name, a personality trait, uh, Thacko armor class because it was Dungeons and Dragons. Thacko armor, yeah, it was that kind of Dungeons and Dragons that had Thacko um, armor and whatever. So I just like printed that out, replaced all of the humanoid races with Hobgoblin, and then just basically went from there. And they developed into this kind of personality-ridden sort of Rat Pack where there was the the um, captain who was sort of like the war grizzled kind of guy and through conversation he was like yeah you know I've been through several wars and I just want a place where I can settle down with my wife and three kids and just you know I've always wanted to farm but I always had to be the captain of a hobgoblin team like that's what I did and everyone was like oh <laughs> he just wants a place for his kids and like, you know, there were other hobgoblins that weren't even that terribly evil. They were just kind of like, they're hobgoblins. That's what they do. They go places and they kill stuff and that's, that's their job. They're hobgoblins. Um, and then there was one that was like too creepy even for hobgoblins. The, the character trait just said, um, randomly generated, just said, uh, collects a variety of knives. <laughs> it was randomly generated. I was like, okay, and that's fair. I mean, I know people, actual humans in this actual world who have a variety of knives and they are d delightful people. Um, very happy to talk about metalwork and their knives, certainly. But this this one was like sort of like he creeped even the other hobgoblins out, and they were like, "He's our forward scout because we don't like to talk to him." <laughs> and he would just his his thing was that he would just appear out of the darkness and was just like, "Hey, I just want you to know, I haven't seen anything up ahead. Check out this knife. <laughs> this is my small mammal killing knife. I use it for woodchucks, squirrels." Maybe even a hobbit in a pinch. I'll be back. And then he would leave, and like, even the NPCs would be like, ugh. The players are like, is he always like this? Or like, he is always like this. Later he'd be like, hey, I just want you to know, there's a group of goblins ahead and I think they're gonna be trouble. It's okay though, check out this knife. This is my goblin killing knife for after dark events. It'll be great. <laughs> Creepy. Uh, but they really knew it. And, they kinda, and, and then all I had to do was like, you hear a voice behind you and everyone's like, oh no. <laughs> hey. <laughs> and like at the table, they're all just like, oh, I want to take a shower. Um, but then it got to the point, like, these were the hobgoblins that they were going, just as a recap, they were going to kill these guys because they didn't even have names or personalities. Just a few sessions ago, I had to, like, kind of put this together between sessions. Um, and so just these kinds of, like, small things can really bring the characters to life. And even as a testament to this, by the end of kind of that little adventure, like, the captain of the hobgoblins uh, almost died, and all of the players were really legitimately upset about that. They were like, he's got to make it. He's got a wife and three kids. Come on, you're gonna get your farm. We're gonna, come on, everyone protect. All right. What's that? Oh, did he get that? He did, actually. Yes, they did, they got back. You are all clapping for, for a two-hit dice hobgoblin. I want you to remember this moment. You are clapping for a two-hit dice hobgoblin and you only had five minutes of characterization for him. 
What was his name? Uh, ooh, you know what? I actually think I have the sheet in here. <laughs> All right, my laptop is a mess, but I am going to take a look take a look for it. Uh, laptop bag is a mess. My laptop is also a mess, but that's not really the point. Uh, so I will take a look and see if I can find it at the very end. But in the meantime, I'm going to talk about sources of inspiration. There we go. Uh, sources of inspiration. Uh, so Mike, you, you might be saying, uh, this was all very great of you, and we're all very pleased about Harvard and the Hobgoblins, but um, where do we get these ideas? They're like, where do you get your ideas? And I'm like, my brain. From my idea-getting knife. <laughs> Sharp-witted. Ah. Uh, people watching is actually a great way to do it. Um, not necessarily for villains specifically, depending on where you are people watching, I suppose. Um, but just people watching, like, I mean, of course, MAGFest is a great place to people watch, uh, especially with all of the lovely um, outfits that are going by. Um, but just, like, sit down at your local mall or even, you know, just if there's a cafe that has a place where you can sit outside and just look around and just kind of think, like, I wonder what that person is thinking. I wonder what they're doing. Uh, I wonder where they're going. And just kind of, you can invent little stories for them. Um, it can be very, just kind of an interesting sort of a creative writing sort of a experience. Um, I always recommend chatting with people that you normally wouldn't. Uh, I've found myself talking to very unusual people under very unusual circumstances. Uh, and it always kind of reminds me, oh, right, some people have this perspective that I would not normally have considered. Or, you know, go and talk to someone who's not in your line of work, maybe isn't, uh, maybe isn't even from, okay, this is maybe a little dicey these days, but maybe not even from your political party or, you know, general, general consensus. Just see what makes them tick. Um, just, and it doesn't have to be like, why do you believe what you believe? I mean, just be like, hey, how's it going? What's going on? You know? Uh, what are you into? You know? That's a question I often ask people, just like, hey, what are you into? You, know? uh, you can also, fiction. Um, there's an old saying, uh, good writers borrow, but great writers steal. You know who said that? Me. <laughs> yep, joke still works. Um, it is an, but it is an old expression because a good writer, you know, takes the idea and gives credit where credit is due. But if you're really crafty about it, you can steal an idea and then tweak it enough that nobody can tell that it was stolen. Um, and so you can, you know, and for role-playing games, I mean, honestly, most role-playing games, if I was running something and I was like, hey, do you guys remember the scene from Lord of the Rings where, like, you're, they had the Balrog and stuff? I'm like, we're doing that. It's a role-playing game. It's not like, uh, you know, Tolkien's going to show up and be like, where's my copyright? Um, where's my copyright? Where's my money? You can't do that. You shall not pass. Um, so you can steal these ideas from fiction, movies, video games, books, you know, whatever it is. Slam poetry, if that's where you're getting the ideas. Uh, and of course, what better place to look for how people act than history? I mean, it might seem kind of straightforward, like, you know, how are people going to act? Well, history. Game of Thrones reads like a history book about Europe because it is based on the history of Europe. And it is still not as bonkers as the actual history of Europe. I mean, I, I'm still floored. There, you know, I was reading through just the, the British Civil War of the 1800s. I'm like, wow, Cromwell just locked Parliament in the Parliament building until they started passing laws? Literally locked the doors? I would have never m imagined that, that someone would just be like, politicians, you're gonna, like, the, imagine like the war general coming in and just like, nope, you're gonna pass laws and I don't care what they are, but they're gonna get done. Or you're never leaving. Like, that's weird, but it totally happened. Um, so biographies, autobiographies, history, you know, truth is stranger than fiction in many cases. In all cases, many cases. Uh, players are a great source of inspiration, and if I had a dollar for every time I uh, cribbed my notes off of somebody, one of the players, saying something like, I bet they're doing this. I'm like, eh, heck they are, yeah. <laughs> That's way better than what I had. Way better. Oh yeah, no, they were always, oh, they were, you got it, man. You predicted A spot on. I'm so glad I was able to characterize the, these NPCs in a way that made you realize that that was what they were logically going to do. If I had a dollar for every time I did that, I'd have enough money not to work, and then I could actually spend enough time characterizing my NPCs. Um, yeah, players are a great source of inspiration, and sometimes you don't even have to steal their ideas when they're not paying attention. You can actually just ask them directly. Um, sometimes I'll, you know, if I'm, uh, and if I'm in, especially if I'm in a scene that I wasn't expecting, uh, I'll just be like, hey, somebody give me a name. 
what do you think the blacksmith is going to be like? What do you think the bartender should be like? You know, how do you, I'll just even say things like, how do, I, how do you want this scene to go? Do you, are you looking, you know, do we, should we just go through this or are you looking to have like a, a, a real interaction with this character? Um, so yeah, bring your players into it. And the more player buy-in you have in your world, the better. And the more that world becomes theirs, the better. Yes? Sure. Yeah. You know, you walk in, uh, just to, it's clear. Um, he said, you know, you walk into uh, wherever it is, you walk into a bar, and then just ask the players, what are the first, th what are the three things that you notice about the, par about the bar? The first three things to notice, you know, X, Y, Z. Boom. Uh, and of course, a great source of inspiration is your own life experience. Uh, you know, if any of you have worked retail, uh, then you already know how everyone who's worked retail may feel about things throughout history. Uh, so you can bring those kinds of experiences to those characters. If you've ever been sitting in traffic and thought, if I had laser vision, <laughs> I'd be home by now. You can bring those feelings to your villains when you've, uh, you know, when you're when you're working with people in a, as a team. You know, you can bring those to your supporting cast. So there are a lot of uh, real life experiences you can get in. Uh, yeah, so you can pr pretty much draw things from all kinds of places of life. All right. All right, and with just a few minutes left uh, for some questions, uh, I would like to take this moment to say thank you very much. I have been and remain Captain Mike, and it has been a pleasure to give this presentation to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and at this time, I have about five minutes for any questions, and while I am looking for questions, I am also gonna see if I can find that sheet of, uh, of hobgoblins, because I'm pretty sure I saved it. Uh, but do we have any questions? Questions? Was I that good or, yeah? Oh, I did not go for the, the wife and kids' names. Um, and if, I ha if they did have names, then they were just off the cuff and not, not written down, probably. <laughs> I have my Praxis results if anybody wants to know those. Uh, I'm kidding. Those aren't even valid anymore. No, okay. I, I don't seem to have them with me. Uh, yes, question. things that they, you wouldn't think they would care about. Like, well, what's the menu at the bar? Like, how uh, what's, the menu with the, <laughs> what's the menu at the bar? Um, actually, funny you should mention that. A little a while ago, I, I mean, I, I run a, a weekly game that is like a sci-fi thousand years in the future sort of a thing. And um, there was a session where the characters had finally gotten out of jail and they could finally get like real food from a place. And they were like, we, we just get this food. And there was about like five or six minutes where people were saying lines, but all of their actions were like while grabbing a blank type of food. And it was kind of like showing how all of the food types that we think of as being from different places have all kind of been homogenized. Uh, French fry sushi, I think, was my favorite um, one that people just made up. They would just take this thing and this thing and put them together. Um, if, it's, if it's a detail that is truly uh, minute, um, I might say some, could even just say, like, is that important? Or I would just say, what do you want to be on the menu? Like, what's on the menu? What do you want to be on the menu? Uh, mammoth steaks. Oh, well, there's mammoth steaks. What do you know? Um, ideally, I suppose I would keep it to whatever the setting is, whatever would be appropriate. So if it was like Dungeons and Dragons in the Skyrim universe, I could say things like mammoth steaks, or I could say things like, you know, grilled chicken. But if I had like a regular D&D &D setting, mammoth might be out of place. Um, but if I wanted, I could even use that as a chance to highlight the unusualness of the area. Like, you know, if the area was a fishing village specifically, then it would be, of course, all fish or what have you. Good. Or, or, or goblin flank. Like, wow, that's, that's a baller town. Just like, yeah, we got goblins all over the place. We kill them and eat them. That's a hardcore town, man. But that says a lot about the town right there. That was just the menu. <laughs> all right. Uh, sweet. Was there another question? I thought I saw something in the back. Yes. Ninjas are spies. <laughs> he needs to go back to his training. 
He needs to watch the, the VHS, like, So You're a Ninja. Like, they make you watch, watch it for two hours before you're allowed to work. Um, okay, so, yeah, he's not technically a ninja. I guess ninjas can be assassins. Um, and that can be tough. Uh, what's the system, if you don't mind me asking? Pathfinder. So, chaotic evil. Yeah. Um, so the thing about murder, I don't, is this still recording? <laughs> All right, blurring out my face here. The thing about murder is that it's actually harder to get, to get away with than you might think. So what I would recommend is uh, have those consequences catch up to him. Uh, because what he's essentially, oh, so, sorry, still blurry. Um, what, am I, <laughs> what? No, no, you don't have to turn it off, I'm just, I, all I need is for the FBI to like Google search like man in pirate hat talks about murder. <laughs> As they do. Um, so, but what, what he's basically playing is a psychopath. Um, and so I think to make sure that the player recognizes that the character is playing a psychopath and it sounds like not even a very subtle one, um, that, that isn't something that people typically get away with and those people who are psychopaths that kill lots of people, usually the word we use for them is villain. And so groups of paladins might start coming after him. Groups of law enforcement uh, can't get into towns, can't get into bars. People turn him away, even if you know they didn't. He didn't specifically kill them. Um, you know there there have to be some survivors, right? Uh, and if not, Pathfinder. I mean, that's just D and D. You know, uh, again. Um, and so I mean, no alignment. Yeah, I mean, all kinds of spells can reveal those kinds of things. So. You can either sit down with a player and just be like, look, we're gonna be playing the game more so that non-player characters are more like people, which means you have to treat them like people, or, uh, or you're gonna have to have, deal with the consequences of killing people, which are many and varied. Um, any, I mean, think about how many adventuring parties just go after characters who have that same description. Um, and he's probably loaded with gold and magical items too, which makes him a delicious uh, target for adventurers, even other evil ones. Um, so, I mean, you could do that. Uh, I think the simplest thing to do would be if you know, again, know your audience. If you think the person is someone who's doing this because it's just fun, then maybe you just need to make the game more hacky slashy, uh, more into dungeons where you kill everything anyway. Um, or just be like, hey, this is kind of concerning. You know, why is it that you're always killing people and so forth? Cool. Uh, I think I have time for one more question. I have time for one more question. Yes, in the back. So now you have an unkillable what? Oh, Revenants, yes, of course, it's Pathfinder. I was just talking about undead, yes. I mean, how many undead rise from the grave for even lesser evils than that? Yeah, that would be a great thing to do. Have like a host of Revenants. Um, I don't know if you've seen the Lego Ninjago movie. It's better than you think. It has Jackie Chan in it. Um, but there's a part where the, the big bad guy has to deal with all of the first generals that he's fired out of a volcano. And like they all come back to haunt him and they all basically you know, gang up on him in the same way that you could have just like a whole host, a host of revenants just constantly after him. Um, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff that you could do with that. Um, but I think the simplest thing to do uh, would actually be just be to have a chat with the player. And maybe the player is gonna be like, hey, that's awesome, bring it on. And then you basically are playing the, the bad guy. <laughs> Uh, and that, that can work. I mean, I've played in plenty of games where the characters were not good people. The players were, mostly. All right, uh, that is unfortunately my time, so I don't want to take up the room for anyone else, but I will be hanging out if anybody has any additional questions. I'll even continue to look through if anybody has any further questions about the Hobgoblins or about uh, any of the stuff that I've talked about. Oh, don't forget, I can be rated on the guidebook app, so five stars is my ideal, but I do value uh, your honest feedback uh, in any case. Uh, and you, Of course, you can reach me at Captain Mike at CaptainMike.net um, with any questions or comments or concerns that you have. Thank you very much.